Eastman was already at work on a bold innovation to replace glass plates. He thought his idea would completely revolutionize photography. If you're using a camera out in the field and are carrying many dry plates, glass plates with you, uh, the plates become rather heavy. They're also rather fragile. They could break if you drop them. Eastman created a lightweight, rollable film by coating paper with emulsion. This paper film fit into another invention, a roll holder that attached to the back of a camera. Photographers would no longer have to take pictures one glass plate at a time. They could simply roll the film to the next frame. Eastman shared his youthful optimism with colleagues. We'll be ready to scoop the world in the next few weeks, he boasted. He told his mother she would no longer have to take in borders. In the spring of 1885, Eastman introduced his roll holder at a London exhibit for new inventions. It won several awards. Unfortunately, however, this enthusiasm didn't seem to communicate itself to photographers at large who, whilst they admired the roll holder, didn't actually go out there and buy it. So whilst it was a critical success, it was by no means a commercial success. The problem was the film was inadequate, provided very, very weak uh, images that were not up to professional standards whatsoever. Professionals were well aware of the wonderful roll holder technology itself, but the film was the failure, and as a result, the roll holder was a failure. For George Eastman, this rejection by professional photographers was a stinging defeat. He had undoubtedly bragged to uh, associates, uh, particularly those in the business community in Rochester who had seen him leave the bank and all of this, and uh, his business had not really uh, taken off as he had hoped that it would with the dry plates, and now he had the roll holder and all of the promise of the roll holder, and the roll holder fails. And Eastman's in the position now, is his whole venture going to fail? For a while, Eastman's company survived by providing photo finishing and selling paper to print photos. In 1887, Eastman took stock of what he had. A photo service that produced steady business, but not enough for someone with his ambition. And a roll holder that was highly admired but rejected by professionals. Eastman started thinking. If ordinary people could take pictures, maybe they wouldn't be as fussy. He came up with a dramatic innovation, a camera so simple that anyone could use it. Eastman hired a nearby cabinet maker to build a box for the camera's body. He had local machinists make a shutter that could take a picture in a fraction of a second. For the lens, he turned to a small Rochester optical shop run by German immigrants named Bausch and Long. Within a month, he had his camera. But would anyone buy it? In the summer of 1888, ads began to appear for a camera with an unusual name, the Kodak. No one had ever seen anything like it. The Kodak camera basically had uh, very few moving parts. It had a shutter. There was no focusing involved. Uh, there was a little string that would be lifted up to cock the shutter, a button to release the shutter, and a winding key on the top of the camera. The advertising phrase that went with the camera was, you push the button, we do the rest. And basically, that's pretty much how it worked. The Kodak had Eastman's roll holder built into it, loaded with enough paper film to take 100 pictures. When the roll was done, the entire camera was shipped back to Rochester, where the film was developed. Several weeks later, the pictures came back, mounted on cards, 
along with the Kodak, loaded with more film. So for the very first time, you didn't have to be a skilled photographer and skilled in the darkroom to actually make your own photographs. And I would imagine the first take of most people would be, come on, you can't do that. But then the pictures would come back. Someone on your block, you might say, did it. And you see the pictures and you believe. It's an instant conversion as soon as you see the pictures. And you say, my goodness. The Kodak was easy, not just for the person behind the camera, but for those who posed in front of it. There was no complicated equipment or chemicals, just a small black box held by someone they knew. All of a sudden, this little device means you can go into the backyard. You can take a picture of the baby splashing around in a mud puddle. You can go to a picnic or a ball game. You can do it. And you know how hard this is, because you, in your memory, have seen professional photographers all over the place. The hiding of the professional chemistry involved in photography is a stroke of genius in terms of marketing. Another part of the camera's appeal was its name. I devised a name myself. A trademark should be short, vigorous, and capable of being misspelled. It must mean nothing. The name has no dictionary definition. It must be associated only with your product. People know the name. They've heard the name. It's a peculiar name. Everyone's saying the Kodak. What is that? You know, uh, people are using Kodak as a verb, as an adjective, as something synonymous with photography itself. The pictures taken by the new camera also had an unusual name: snapshots. A hunting term meaning to shoot a gun without aiming. In fact, the Kodak had no viewfinder and couldn't be aimed accurately. It looked so unlike large studio cameras that many people didn't realize their photographs were being taken. This was seen as a great threat to personal privacy. In particular, there was a thought that perhaps um, certain people who became known as camera fiends or photographic fiends would hang around beach resorts and they would take photographs of women as they emerged from the waves with their costumes clinging to their bodies. Within a year of its introduction, Eastman had sold 13,000 Kodaks. His factory was developing more than 6,000 photographs every day. Eastman was absolutely delighted with the success of the Kodak camera. As soon as the sales began to come in very early on, he was so impressed with it. He was just like a little kid, just tickled. George Eastman traveled to Europe to open new stores, showing off his Kodak at every opportunity. On one of his trips, he met an American couple living in London. George Dickman was an international businessman with a worldly style. His wife Josephine was a trained singer. Eastman found her charming. Eastman was at ease with the couple, even though he was quite awkward socially. He's a very aggressive planner, very aggressive in his, his whole approach to business. And yet, on the social side, he seems very shy, seems very um, you know, easily intimidated by a social setting. 
The Dickmans became Eastman's closest and most trusted friends. They also offered a cultural education beyond anything he had known. They introduced him to the best of British society, dinners at private clubs and evenings at the theater. They helped him buy art and antiques. Eastman soon named Dickman manager of his London operation. The company was expanding, but the market was limited. Despite the codex popularity, few could afford it. One of the main disadvantages of the original Kodak is the fact that it was very expensive. It cost $25 in 1888, the equivalent of about three months working wage for the average uh, person. So it's really very, very expensive. It was aimed very much at those who went on long holidays, who traveled, people who wanted a record of their travels but didn't want to buy commercially available photographs. So the Kodak was aimed very much at the affluent middle class or the upper classes. One reason the Kodak was expensive was the complicated and time-consuming process needed to print each photo. Printing pictures through the paper backing produced grainy photos. To improve quality, the emulsion was stripped from the paper after developing and mounted on glass for printing. Eastman knew if he could replace the paper with something clear, it would eliminate this step. He and Reichenbach experimented with materials made from wax and moss, even seaweed. Nothing worked. Unknown to Eastman, a clergyman in Newark, New Jersey was already a step ahead. As early as 1886, the Reverend Hannibal Goodwin was experimenting with a type of plastic called celluloid. Goodwin's hobby troubled his congregation. Hannibal Goodwin was quite a tinker, especially in areas of chemistry and photography. There was a, a strong sense of the dignity required of a priest of God and it really seemed inappropriate to many of the parishioners I guess that he would have stains on his hand and even some acid marks on his clothing. Working in the rectory's attic, Goodwin made a transparent film of celluloid. He applied for a patent in 1887. By this time, Henry Reichenbach was experimenting with celluloid as well. After several months, he had a formula that worked. In 1889, two years after Goodwin, Eastman applied for his own patent. Because Reichenbach was more specific about ingredients, the Eastman Company was awarded a patent for transparent film. Goodwin challenged the decision while Eastman charged ahead. Convinced that transparent film would be a tremendous success, Eastman began building a large manufacturing plant on the outskirts of the city. He rewarded Reichenbach handsomely, giving him 50 shares of stock and putting him in charge of what would be called Kodak Park. But when the new factory couldn't produce film fast enough to meet demand, Eastman fumed. The relationship of the boss of a large production facility, such as Eastman is beginning to build in Rochester, is often troubled. And perhaps one of the reasons is the people who are running these big factories still like small shops. They're not comfortable with massive layers of hierarchy in a company. Eastman was not well liked among employees. 
His office was near the women's bathroom. If they made too many trips, they felt his disapproving gaze. He expected the office boy to sharpen pencils in a particular way and instructed janitors on the proper way to use a broom. He rarely gave praise and was quick to criticize. When he found fault with a worker, he'd pull his coat back, put his hands in his hip pockets and, according to one employee, curse a wide blue streak. Henry Reichenbach became a special target. Reichenbach has a lot of responsibility. He's manager of Kodak Park, and uh, he has responsibility for the emulsion, and he's got film batches that are going bad. Why can you not supply this factory with emulsion? Neff reports to me that he has had no emulsion. I've covers made it once. For there are a lot of lights that are burning constantly that are not required. Can't you get some emulsion? Let me know tomorrow when he can have the emulsion. With four small children at home, Reichenbach had grown weary of the long hours and increasing demands. Late in 1891, he and several other Kodak chemists took steps to start their own competing business. Eastman fired them. His action would prove disastrous. Soon, angry customers were complaining that Kodak film was no good. And as the months went by, this problem built up until Eastman had to make the decision to actually stop film production because the problems were so great. Then, in 1893, an economic depression swept the world, and Eastman's company went deeply into debt. Months passed, and still no film was shipped. Employees saw their boss turn into a nervous, ragged wreck. At the plant in England, things were no better. When a British bank threatened to foreclose on a loan, George Dickman wrote to his friend for money. But Eastman had none to give. We shall have all that we can do to take care of our own finances. It is extremely unlikely that we will be able to lend you any money. I write this to you so that you will not count on it. Yours truly, George Eastman, Treasurer. 1893 was probably the, the lowest point for the young company. Um, they were in debt, severely in debt, and really, it was difficult to see a way out of this. 